Time for members' statements. So I recognize the member from. <laughs> Excuse me. Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. Hundreds of residents of apartment buildings in Crescent Town and Beaches East York, as well as elsewhere in the riding and across the city, are terrified. Crescent Town is a warm, vibrant community of primarily racialized people, many of whom are newcomers, many of whom are essential workers, many of whom lost their jobs due to COVID-19. This is a community that has been hit hard. Some people work multiple poorly paid essential jobs to which they must take public transit. If they become ill, they can't self-isolate. They frequently share apartments with large families, so Michael Guerin Hospital has been seeing multiple members of the same family hospitalized with COVID-19. Now many are haunted by eviction. They have followed the Premier's advice to feed their families first if they didn't also have money for rent. But the landlord, Pinedale Properties, has not heeded his advice to work things out. Instead, they have been served eviction notices. In some cases, the manager has banged on their doors with a debit machine in hand, telling them COVID is nothing and threatening them with immediate eviction if they don't pay. Bill 184 enables landlords like Pinedale to evict tenants without a hearing if they believe that those tenants have reneged on a payment plan. But what if they get sick and can't work or otherwise lose their jobs? We need immediate rent subsidies, and we need a plan to ensure that no COVID-related evictions will ever be permitted in Ontario. Anything less is cruel, and it's absolutely crucial that the government act now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say that uh, this has been a tough period with the COVID pandemic, um, but good news is ahead. We're seeing the patio start to open in uh, York Region. Um, Thornhill's very excited and anxiously awaiting. And I have some good news to report, which is that Smart Centers, uh, which operates the stores and restaurants around DeSera Drive, just north of the Promenade Mall, um, has agreed to work with myself, the City of Vaughan, and Councillor Sheffman, and see about closing off a block of DeSera between Centre Street and where the light where CIBC is, so that we can enjoy a streetwide patio. And I'm looking forward to actually seeing a lot of the residents there. Um, I think that Thornhill can set an example for the rest of the province in terms of finding opportunities for people to socially distance, but socialize all the same outside in the nice weather in the coming months ahead. So some of the restaurants that are there are Mezzanote, Bagel World, Maple Sushi, Subway, Marble Slab, Copper Branch, Boneyard, Halibut House, Maron To Go, Maple Art Grill, and the Greek, st Greek Stop. So there's lots of opportunities to eat and also to socialize. So I want to wish everybody um, good luck to all the businesses. It's tough on them. I hope everybody's going to have patience as the various regions open. And let's all work together to make sure that this is successful. Well said. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for London North Centre. When COVID-19 hit, London acted quickly and decisively. City Hall passed measures to support businesses, help the vulnerable, and collaborated with stakeholders in their many task force meetings. Wise and prudent stewards of the public purse, London boasts a triple A credit rating, earned consecutively for the last 43 years. But COVID-19 has put London on the brink of financial crisis, and we need direct financial support from the province immediately. As the hub of southwestern Ontario, London is a leader in healthcare, medical innovation, education, digital creative, arts and culture, tourism, agribusiness, and many more. London supports a variety of communities, including Middlesex, Elgin, Oxford, Lambton, Chatham-Kent, Huron, and Perth. To ignore London is to ignore all of southwestern Ontario, which the previous Liberal government did at their peril. Tax dollars travel from London to Queen's Park, but rarely are seen again. During this crisis, we need those same tax dollars to travel back down to London. As Mayor Ed Holder states, when it comes to essential services, municipalities represent both the front line and the bottom line. Today, I'm asking the Premier and his government for $30 million in emergency funding for London. Without provincial support, cities will have to hike taxes, cut essential services, and everyday Ontarians will bear the cost. It's time for this government to step up, help with the heavy lifting, and bring much-needed relief to London. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next member statement, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The date, March 17. The year, 2020. That was the official beginning of Ontario's state of emergency and global pandemic. The results of this pandemic have been devastating. It's been three months since the province declared a state of emergency. Remember, our primary goal was to keep Ontarians safe and healthy. There was no playbook. We had to create one. Now, in reopening the province, some of us want to go faster while others say, slow down. Regardless of one's point of view, our government is taking a deliberate, well-thought-out approach to getting Ontario back on its feet. On a local level in my riding of Chatham, Kent, Leamington, Dash Core Aluminum, located in Chatham, were able to quickly adapt uh, their operation to produce medical sector products, some of which were in the form of modular partition systems. And they were able to maintain a large percentage of employees in order to work on these products. Nice going, Dash Core. You helped answer the call as a result of this pandemic. Now, one thing has been true throughout this crisis. Ontarians are stronger together. We have seen countless examples of this form, all uh, this form from all corners of the great province, from drive-by birthday parties to window visits at long-term care homes to our small and medium-sized businesses retooling to support the fight against this terrible disease. Together, we will get through this pandemic and our economy and employment will rebound. We will be even stronger than pre-COVID. I'm sure 2020 will be a year marked with an asterisk. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. Today in Niagara Region and across this province, essential frontline workers are calling a day of action to extend pandemic pay to everyone. I am tempted to list the number of valuable members of our frontline health care workers currently excluded from the pandemic pay. It is so tempting to point out how many of them deal directly with COVID-19 patients and just don't make the Premier's all-star list. I could do that. You know, it is a worthwhile statement, but I think it misses a story. I find more interesting about pandemic pay. Because as many times as I get frontline workers reaching out to me, I get an equal amount of executive directors, administrative leads, senior levels of management reaching out on behalf of their frontline staff. One executive director at the Martindale Place at a congregated care facility in St. Catharines reached out to my office twice on this matter. For them, it is not about the extra few dollars. It is recognizing the real work, the real sacrifices frontline workers do. These local leaders care so intensely for the people that are sacrificing so much right now. It's the nonprofits and service managers who reach out because their shelters, community outreach teams and or hospital staff that is excluded. For them it is about appreciation of their sacrifices. So, Mr. Premier, do what is right. Expand this list. These heroes deserve more than empty words during a press conference. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's been months since we've seen the first case of COVID-19 in this province, and we've learned that physical distancing, frequent hand washing, and wearing masks are the three most important things we can do to protect others and ourselves. We've yet to get one critical part right, and that's universal masking. As we're starting to reopen our economy, people will inevitably come closer together. Universal masking will play a greater role in allowing our economy to continue to open. We've seen how places around the world, like Hong Kong, South Korea, and Taiwan, have been able to manage the spread of the virus effectively with universal masking, whether it's mandatory or a societal norm. It's simply not good enough for us to say, wear a mask when you're outside. I'd like to thank everyone in Ontario, the United Way of my city, Masks, uh, Masks for Canada, for all the work in this area. But we know that you can't do it alone. So I'm calling on the government to do the three following things, and actually us. So we need to lead by example. Wear a mask when you're indoors, when you can't physically distance. You know, when we're here in the legislature, I know it's hard in here, but when we're in the building, when you're shopping, it's about protecting others. Undertake an aggressive public advocacy campaign so that people can understand why we need to do it, both for health and for our economy. And the government must, like the federal government, procure masks for people who cannot afford them. 
I think it's critical that the government do that so they can work in, in uh, concert with municipalities to ensure that the most vulnerable, the people who can't afford them, are able to get non-medical masks. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you. Speaker, the month of June is Scleroderma Awareness Month, and today I'd like to draw your attention to this little-known but often debilitating condition. Scleroderma refers to a group of rare disorders that involve the hardening and tightening of the skin and connective tissues. Depending on which area of the body is affected, this can result in stiff joints and reduced mobility, as well as digestive, lung, kidney, and heart issues. In severe cases, it can even be life-threatening. Speaker, while it affects more women than men, anyone can get scleroderma, and it can be caused by a variety of factors, from environmental to genetic. Speaker, I'm sad to say that as of this moment, there is no cure. That's why it's so important to use this month as an opportunity to talk about scleroderma and to raise awareness and funds so that someday soon, no person ever have to deal with these symptoms again. Since 2007, the Scleroderma Society of Ontario has done amazing work by advocating for and improving the quality of life of those living with the condition. They raise awareness, support research of those living with the condition. Mr. Speaker, because of the pandemic, no traditional walk or run will be held this year. But you can still visit the scleroderma.ca to join the virtual event and support this worthy and important cause. Speaker, scleroderma can be an incredibly difficult and pain painful condition to live with, but as long as there is hope for a cure, and there is a great deal of hope, we need to find it. Thank you, Speaker. Member Statements. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today, I wish to speak about the changes that this government has made to foster care. During this pandemic, when children and youth in care need more protection than ever before, this government has quietly loosened the rules that keep them safe. In May, the government increased the number of children that can be placed in a foster home. The previous limit of four, which doesn't include biological children, was already high. Further, while increasing the size of homes, this government reduced the important oversight measures that keep kids safe. In-person home visits and interviews were scrapped and replaced with inadequate phone inspections. There was even a government communication early on in the pandemic asking agencies to refrain from requesting police record checks. These rules are meant to ensure that the living situation is safe and healthy for children. It's the responsibility of this government to make sure that inspections of care settings can be done safely. Rather than cutting these regulations that are meant to keep children out of harm's way, they have changed the rules that make children and youth in care more vulnerable to abuse. We need these oversight mechanisms to rest be restored immediately to ensure our children's safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. COVID-19 has hit the hospitality and tourism industry especially hard. In total, all of the industries that are part of the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries represent $75 billion in economic activity for our province. Sport and the tourism industry associated with sports are a major contributor. That's why I'm happy to stand here today and talk about an event that was held in my riding just this past summer. We had the great opportunity and pleasure to host the World Women's Under-19 Lacrosse Championships. It was a collaboration with our local lacrosse associations, Trent University, Sir Sanford Fleming College, and the City of Peterborough. It was also the very first event that I, as a newly elected official, was able to secure provincial funding for. We had teams from Australia, Belgium, China, the Czech Republic, England, Germany, Hong Kong, Israel, Ireland, Jamaica, Japan, Kenya, South Korea, Mexico, New Zealand, Puerto Rico, Scotland, Chinese Taipei, Wales, and North America was represented not only by teams from Canada and the United States, but we also had First Nations proudly represented by Haudenosaunee. 
The 10-day event generated $3.4 million in economic impact for our community alone. There are so many volunteers I'd like to thank, but I don't have the time for it, so I'll center out just a couple whose leadership made it happen. Fred Blows, Lois Tuffin, Shara McNeil, and Kelly Roberts. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm pleased to report that two long-term care homes, Chad Boya Gibson and Expanded Care Bayview in my riding of Don Valley North are now COVID-19 free. Currently, no resident, no staff has the virus. They will remain resident. Going forward, as they relies on all health and safety protocols to keep the vulnerable seniors health and safe. Thanks to the concerted efforts of the home dedicated staff, with the support and cooperation of the long-term care residents, their families, and their community, this is a wonderful achievement worth to celebrate. Both homes update the COVID-19 situation weekly to residents, their families, and to our office as well. They communicate all outbreak information with honesty, transparency, compassion, and hope. Speaker, when the Don Valley North community realized that long-term care homes in our area needed help, they didn't hesitate to rally around the coast. From food and PPE donations to kind words of encouragement, these long-term care homes received the support when they needed it most. Mr. Speaker, I'm grateful to the excellent people of Don Valley North who care about the struggles of others and show up to offer help. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning.